This channel is part of the History Hit Network. When Akhenaten became pharaoh of Egypt around the year 1360 BC, he kindled a religious revolution. He wanted to restrict worship to the sun god Atun. Egypt had been a polytheistic realm for more than 2,000 years. It was an immense risk here of all places to attempt to found a religion with a single god. Akhenaten was not only a founder of a religion, he was the first founder of any religion who is known to history. The visions of the ruler on the Nile opened up a new chapter in human history. The great temple at Thebes, the stronghold of Akhenaten's opponents. This is where the pharaoh initiated the struggle for his new religion. He sent a momentous message to the high priest of Amun. The king ordered the construction of a new sanctuary, honoring the hitherto insignificant god, Atun. It was the largest place of worship ever planned in Egypt. Sacrifices to the new god were to be made on more than 400 altars. The old temple, until then the most splendid building in Egypt, seemed modest in comparison. It was a scandal that the king had even considered this plan. The temple of Karnak was a mighty fortress. Generations of pharaohs had made it their ambitious task to constantly increase the size and splendor of the chambers of worship. The treasury and storehouses of the holy precinct were just as full and rich as those of the pharaoh. The place was frequented by the country's elite. Hundreds of priests served in rites in this sprawling complex. The temple's schools educated the future leaders of what was then the most powerful realm in the world. Karnak was a powerful state within the state. And its high priest was a dangerous rival to the royal court. He was responsible for ensuring that the gods were well disposed towards people. His contemporaries firmly believed that the country was doomed if the cult was interrupted. Even though the priests were in theory only charged with maintaining order in the temple, they also had worldly power. They called themselves servants of God, but primarily they served themselves. Sacrifices of incense, food and drink were offered to the gods daily in order to buy their goodwill. Whole armies of priests and officials performed their duties at the temple in a strict hierarchy. In addition to the services, the buildings were in constant need of repair and beautification. However, to Akhenaten, the inner sanctum of the temple seemed like a dungeon. Here, true faith could not blossom. His decision was irrevocable. Amun's time was over. Long live Atun, god of the sun. The White Chapel in Karnak dates from the time when Amun became the main god of Egypt. It was Pharaoh Sesostris I who had it built. Its images and hieroglyphs contain an allegedly everlasting truth. Over and over again, they show the king communing with the god. The inscriptions conjure up their magic unity. Amun and the family of the gods recognized the pharaoh when he sacrificed to them. It was a mutual agreement that appears to have been vindicated time and time again. No pharaoh could avoid the traditional rites, until the arrival of Akhenaten. 
The rules of the realm of the pharaohs said, the king should rule in the palace, the priest should rule at the temple. However, the more the high priest's influence grew, the more and more difficult it became for him to adhere to this rule. Already his predecessors had forced their will on the pharaoh several times, and no one had until then dared to rebel against the priests of the highest god. In fact, the first step taken by Akhenaten was to raise the economic status of the newly founded temple of Aton above all other temples, and to make these other temples pay a kind of tribute. The second step was to close the other temples anyway. But it is still very significant that the first measures were carried out on an economic level, and theological steps were only taken later. The priests of Amun displayed their power in numerous processions. But the change in their fortunes had already been prepared by Akhenaten's father. Amenhotep III had himself depicted next to other gods more and more frequently, an insult to the divine overlord Amun. However, the pharaoh hit the high priest hardest in his own domain. Like Amun, Amenhotep had himself carried to the new temple at Luxor in a ceremonial sedan chair, a humiliation for the servants of the god. All the same, Amenhotep did not want to abandon traditional ideas of faith entirely. First, he turned himself into a god by building the temple of Luxor. His brilliant master builder, Amenhotep, designed a grandiose sanctuary in which the gods and the king were worshipped alike. It was a stroke of genius that gave the architect fame and honor beyond his death, and the pharaoh was held in awe by his subjects. When Amenhotep died, the priests who had once been all-powerful had already been stripped of a large portion of their rule. With his son's ascension to the throne, a new chapter in Egyptian history began. Still he was named, like his father, Amenhotep, one beloved of Amun. But Amun was not going to enjoy the reign of this young king. Is Akhenaten the forefather of all the great monotheistic world religions? In any case, he stands at the beginning. He stands at the beginning of a line that is then continued in the persons of Moses, Zarathustra, Jesus and Mohammed. The pharaoh was as if obsessed by a religious fervor. Any means seemed justified to him to enforce worship of his single god. For this, he even changed his name. Amenhotep IV became Akhenaten, the exalted of Atum. This was the name under which he wanted the world to worship him from then on. Even the novel bas reliefs on the walls of temples and tombs were a provocation for conservative priests. Akhenaten's shocking watchword was truth. In a realm where beauty and balance were valued above everything else, the ruling couple were suddenly depicted as misshaped, fat and ugly, with paunches and wide hips. And above it all, there was an incomprehensible god. This is the traditional way of showing the Egyptian sun god, always with a human body, a falcon's head, and the sun disc, and always seen from the side. The problem resulting from this is that only one person can face the god at any given time. Traditionally, it was the Egyptian pharaoh. During the Amarna period, the situation was special, in that the king and queen were supposed to benefit equally from the presence of the sun god. Akhenaten's revolutionary contribution now is to dispense with the body of the sun god completely and to turn the sun disk around to the front so that king and queen can benefit equally from the sun god's signs of life. Until then, only the pharaoh and the priests had been permitted to celebrate the service to the gods. However, by order of Akhenaten, a woman was now allowed to do so too, Nefertiti, 
an unforgivable violation of a taboo. As far as the priest was concerned, the pharaoh had declared war on the gods, thereby severely endangering the continued existence of Egypt. The high priest had to refuse to obey. However, Akhenaten preempted him. He had the temple stormed and the sanctuaries defiled. He prohibited a tradition several thousand years old and persecuted its adherents mercilessly. His henchmen had only one aim, the annihilation of all vestiges of the old religion. They destroyed its inscriptions even in the least accessible places. No one dared stop these royally supported iconoclasts until all the temples of Amun were reduced to rubble. The stable world order was in upheaval. A revolution was shaking the pharaonic empire. Traditional law and order were being stripped of their power. The priests of Amun strove desperately to save at least a few idols of their god. Overnight, Amun had become the arch enemy. Hard times were dawning for the realm on the Nile. Atun was supposed to shine, and this was why the pharaoh decided to leave Thebes. In the city of Amun, a new beginning seemed impossible. Far from the sights of the old gods, Akhenaten searched for a place fit for the worship of a new god. He found it downstream, at the center of his empire, in a place that is today called Amana. Having shaken off the shackles of the past, the ruling couple wanted to make their dream come true. This is where it was to rise, the holy city of the god Atun a colossal backdrop for the cult of the sun god. A god who assumed his rule over the sky every day, visible for all. The location of the new capital was desolate and uninhabited, but it was ideal for Akhenaten's plans. Where the temple of Atun was to be built, no other god had ever been worshipped, virgin territory in the religious sense. Far and wide, the pharaoh had these words hewn into the rock. View Akhenaten, which Atun ordained to be created for him as his everlasting monument. The high priest of Amun suffered an unparalleled humiliation. He was condemned to work for the monuments of his arch enemy in the quarry. But Akhenaten could not rob him of the faith in his god. In a very short time, a city was built, the like of which there had never been before in Egypt. It was a giant center of worship laid out on the drawing board. Akhenaten himself supervised the surveyor's work and proudly announced that he wanted to stay in this place until the mountains rise up and go on their way and water runs upstream. This is how the city may once have looked. This reconstruction is based on data from decades of excavations. The pharaoh had consecrated the largest building to his god. Blinding sunlight filled the temple. Several hundred sacrificial altars stood under the open sky. Akhenaten's idea was that nothing should obstruct the sun god. He fills the land with his rays and gives life to everything. He who daily intoxicates my eyes by his sight when he rises in the temple of Atun at Akhet Atun. This reconstruction of a part of the temple's wall is three meters long. The scene symbolizes the sunrise of Atun in the morning and it shows how its rays brings the animals to life. 
In der Naturphilosophie, in Aten's 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 philosophy, this means that the only God Aton is responsible for all aspects of life. And this life begins in the morning with the sunrise. Just like the sun god crossed the sky daily in the Egyptians' imagination, Akhenaten also drove throughout his realm in his golden chariot as a vital messenger of peace. Images in the tombs of Akhet Atun show how much the king identified with a god. The heavenly chariot was almost everywhere. As if seized by the ecstasy of speed, Akhenaten's drive became a headlong soar. No one seemed to be able to slow him down anymore. For his subjects, he was a visible god who performed miracles and influenced the fate of each person, one who held life and death in his grasp. The king himself composed a hymn in which he described his god's omnipresent influence. This great sun chant of Akhenaten's begins in Egyptian with the words, You appear beautiful on the horizon of the sky, you, living sun who rules life. You have risen on the horizon of the east and have filled every country with your beauty. Beautiful you are radiant high above all lands. Your rays encompass all lands to the limits of everything that you have created. When you set on the western horizon, then the world is in blackness, in a state of death. And a spur. There is a direct trace of Akhenaten's great son hymn via Canaan in the Bible in the 104th Psalm. Verses 20 to 30 of the 104th Psalm are a shortened Hebrew translation of Akhenaten's great son Shant. Whereas the God of the Bible despised any and all worship of humans, such worship was at the center of Akhenaten's religion. Only he was able to interpret the will of Atun. There was no route to the God other than through him. The people had to pay homage to him if their prayers were to be heard. However, many did not want to give up their time-tested faith. Even in the new capital, some still prayed to the old gods. It gave solace in everyday worries to address the gods directly with pleas and prayers. People made their sacrifices despite the constant danger of discovery. The proof of this is a find from the ruins of Amana. This vase of the god Bes shouldn't exist in Amana. The only god permitted by Akhenaten was Atun, the sun god. However, next to him and below him, behind drawn curtains as it were, the population of Amana continued to worship a number of the old traditional gods. There really wasn't any other possible development. If there's a decree from above that all the faith that's grown over 1500 years is suddenly supposed to be no longer valid, there's no way there are not going to be problems. In their songs of praise, the people sang, You are the image of the living Atun. But what did Akhenaten's subjects really think? The pharaoh may not have wasted a single thought on this worry. He had himself worshipped like a distant, exalted image of the god. He claimed the right of resurrection from the dead only for himself, taking away all hope of being born again from the rest of humanity. The pharaohs built pyramids and temples even in the days of the old realm, in order to be closer to the gods once the pharaoh was dead. They hid their burial chambers and sarcophagi deep inside these immense buildings. The walls were adorned with countless hieroglyphs, magical chants and texts from the Book of the Dead in which the burial rituals were described, and how the dead king was transformed into Osiris, the ruler of the underworld, in order to rise from the dead, like him, to eternal life. Open the tomb, 
break the wall, and the gates of heaven are opened for you, promised the writing on the wall. The dead man had to account for his life before the tribunal of the dead. The god Anubis weighed his heart. It was not allowed to be weighed down with any sins, otherwise a monster devoured it, equivalent to eternal death. At the entrance to the chamber of the sarcophagus, a priest performed the ritual of the opening of the mouth, a symbolic act of revival by means of touching the dead body. Akhenaten had all this prohibited without exception. In the desolate plain of Tel al-Amana, there is no perceptible trace of the 50,000 people who once lived here. The Sun City vanished thousands of years ago. Even Akhenaten's name was purged from the annals. The whole city of Amarna should be destroyed after Akhenaten because every Egyptian worshipped Aton through him. And this is why you can even, the hands of the sun are coming to Akhenaten. And therefore, it is only Akhenaten who had the connection between Aton and the people. Then when Akhenaten died, the connection is finished. And this is why Amarna had no use. After Akhenaten's death, the priests of Aton were those who had to flee. Iconoclasts once again ravaged the temples and palaces. Now it was Akhenaten's name that was chiseled off everywhere. His god vanished into insignificance. Amun became king of the gods once again. Under his patronage, a new ruler named Harim Heb had the memory of the heretic deleted from history. In Karnak, Harim Heb erected mighty buildings for Amun and used every stone of the dismantled temple of Atun as filling material for the new buildings. Today, reconstructing the walls of the temple of Atun presents archaeologists with a barely possible task. No image of the heretic king was supposed to remain for posterity. Even his capital, Akhet Atun, was abandoned. Akhenaten's vision of a single god seemed to have failed. After his death, he reaped the violence that he himself had sown during his lifetime. Even if Akhenaten's name was deleted from the lists of the kings and his monuments disappeared from the face of the earth, it still has to be said that his religious revolution changed the Egyptian world profoundly. On the surface, religion reverted to tradition, but the idea of the unity of God never left Egyptian thought again from then on, so that behind the multitude of gods, who were now once again worshipped, Egyptians recognized more and more clearly the one god who revealed himself in this multitude. In Abu Simbel, Ramesses II had a gigantic temple complex built, propaganda made of stone. These buildings for himself and his spouse Nefertari were driven deep into the Nubian rock. Colossal statues more than 20 meters high glorify the pharaoh as Amun's representative. Amun in the shape of the sun god, far away, unreachable in the sky, but at the same time close coming to the assistance of the praying man. In this way, the former god of war appeared in a new dress as the god of the poor and downtrodden without displacing the other gods. Already the population nearly worshipped him more than the rulers and priests. He was a popular god, not an abstract vision of the elite. When, every morning at sunrise, the miracle of his divine appearance occurred in Abu Simbel, the ritual concerned all Egyptians. 
Every spring and autumn solstice, the light rays reached as far as the cultic images in the inner sanctum, in order to symbolize the resurrection of a pharaoh who had died. Even for normal mortals, there was once again hope of a life after death. Atun's strict ruling seemed to be forgotten completely. However, the idea of monotheism lived on in secrecy until it began its unstoppable success, rising again many centuries later. Akhenaten's vision of a single god was going to conquer the whole world.